I'm at the offices of Dr. Richard Westrick, who you might remember I interviewed before on the Honest Channel. That was via Zoom, but today, seeing as we're in New York, we've come up to the very upscale Upper East Side of Manhattan, where his offices are, to interview him today about facial fat transfer. Hi, I'm Dr. Westreich. I'm a facial plastic surgeon. I practice in Manhattan. Well, Dr. Westrick, it's lovely to actually meet you in person. You as well. At your offices in this fabulous location. This is the place to be, the Upper East Side, I can tell. Even from the grocery store at the end of the street, it was just that level above. Mm -hmm. We're talking today about a procedure that I see just from viewers' comments is becoming increasingly popular. I'm asked more and more and more about it facial fat transfer. Is that something you do much of in, in your clinic? Yes, and, and I agree with you. It has become more popular in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. I think that um, people have obviously been doing fillers for a long time, but specifically in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of information and stories done about fillers and long-term consequences mm -hmm. and filler phase and celebrities going on record of getting rid of their filler because there are issues with filler. Yeah. And so because volume loss is definitely a component of facial aging, people have been looking for other ways to add the volume that's not filler, and that's how you get to fat. So they see it as a more kind of natural option. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's your fat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's no issue in terms of you having a reaction or having, um, you know, lack of take of the fat because it's somebody else's fat, obviously that would be a problem to transplant. So it's your own stuff, it's natural, and you're volumizing and you are making an intervention that is a known thing to help with facial aging. So can you just talk us through what actually happens when you do the fat transfer? You're yes. taking it from another part of the body. Where, where are you typically taking the fat from? So usually the best fat is from the abdomen or the okay. stomach. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually a sufficient amount of fat there. Mm -hmm. Also, the harvest is pretty innocuous and easy from the patient's standpoint of recovery, and the fat is reasonably robust. Mm -hmm. You can take fat from anywhere, but then you get into problems of yield. Right. So when you, when you take fat, you then have to purify it and separate it from the liquid and other things, so you just have mostly pure fat. Some people use a centrifuge, some people use um, just gravitational decanting, um, but you wanna have as little of other stuff as possible yeah. so it's easier to purify. So abdomen works very well for that. Something like the flanks is not good fat okay. because it's very fibrous and so there tends to be a lot of bleeding when you do liposuction. So your yield on flank fat is very low. Other places that are good for fat are inner thigh Mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of fat there. And so what happens is if you're aggressive trying to harvest fat for a transfer, you may cause an inner thigh contour deformity. Okay. So there's limitations of inner thigh fat. And then outer thigh fat is kind of in between abdomen and flank. Mm -hmm. You can use it, um, but it's not optimal. So if you have an abdominal fat, that's where we like to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a patient the other week that had like no abdominal well, fat I was gonna whatsoever. Say, well, if you get a very lean patient, which you probably have quite a few of, I mm -hmm. would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. In those patients, then you have no choice but to go either, you know, gluteal fat mm -hmm. or inner or outer thigh. Yeah. But you have to explain to them that the yield that we may get of the fat may not be sufficient to kind of treat all the areas to the extent we want. Are you normally sourcing from just one area or are you kind of going around that area to get to get the fat? I mean, optimally, you want to source from one area. Yeah, yeah. You want to source just from the abdomen. Yeah. Um, if you have to do a lot of fat, you may then be obligated to go to different areas to harvest more. You know, the issue is if you harvest, let's say, 100 cc's of fat mm -hmm. from the liposuction when you harvest, you're going to get out of that 100, maybe 10 cc's of actual injectable fat. Mm -hmm. There's that much loss in the purification process. And then of that 10 cc's, if you keep half of it, that's good. Yeah. So 100 cc's of stuff that you remove gives you ultimately about five mLs of fill. And you're doing this in um, one procedure. So they come in, they get the whole thing done, 
Under general? No, you can actually even do it under local, but okay. you can often do it in sedation. It depends on the amount. Yeah. I've done it both ways. Mm -hmm. For smaller areas, you can do a good amount of facial fat transfer just under local mm -hmm. without anything else. Including then injecting it into the mm -hmm. face. Okay. Yeah. So um, you take the fat, you treat the fat, mm -hmm. and then what happens from there? So then you inject it. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to inject it in a variety of different planes, meaning depths, yeah. depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you always just treating this area, the upper cheekbones with fat? Or are you putting fat in other... Can you put it elsewhere in the face to volumize? So you can put it elsewhere. Uh -huh. um, the issue comes about that fat has a potential to be a little bit globular. Right, okay. Because, you know, you inject it back in and it's... It's, it's obviously it isn't chunks of fat, yeah. but it can settle that way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the injection we do is in the cheek area, in the submalar area below the cheek. When you're doing the cheek, you're going to do some on the bone. You may do some intramuscularly, and you may do some right underneath the skin surface, kind of layer it yeah. in different tissues. If you're going to start injecting fat into softer areas like around the eyes or nasolabial folds, that situation, most people are using what's called nano fat. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, it's basically the same thing. It's just that the harvest technique is you're harvesting smaller particles of fat. Okay. And so the nano fat tends to distribute a little bit smoother mm -hmm. and decrease the risk of getting irregularities. Yeah. How do you decide with the patient how much fat they want to go into the face, that final look. Can you give them a visual before? Do you do any kind of imaging before that they look at? Or is this just a discussion between you? It's very hard to um, image volume. Yeah. Because it's just highlights and shadows. Yeah. I've done it, but it's, you know, just as an illustration of why we want to add the volume to get this highlight more consistent without this shadow and deep in that. And they can see it from that, but you can't give them a, a realistic representation. Um, the amount that you decide, you know, and, and by the way, some patients, if they're unsure, will test the volumization with filler. Right. Okay. Beforehand, yeah. you know, obviously it doesn't make sense to do the filler and dissolve it two weeks later just because it's pricey. Mm -hmm. But some people will do the filler and then maybe a year or two later, if they don't want to do filler again, then they'll look into getting fat transfer. Yeah. Um, what I tell the patients is that even though most of the time you lose 50% of the fat that you inject, you don't always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So um, because it's very difficult to remove the fat once you've injected it, um, I tell them we should inject the amount that we want mm -hmm. um, and not more to try and compensate for the loss. So Does that make sense? Um, so some people have to go for a second round is my, is okay, my point. Okay, right. At what point are you losing the 50%? Um, does that happen quite After rapidly? After injection. Yeah, because the fat has to, any transplanted tissue, the fat is no yeah. different than like a skin graft. Yeah. You, you're injecting it. It doesn't have a blood supply. Mm -hmm. It takes a couple of days for the blood supply to come about. And then obviously some of those cells aren't going to survive even once the blood supply you know, becomes um, uh, able to support the cell. 50% is just kind of a general number I'm throwing out mm -hmm. there. There are other people that say they only lose 30% or they have this special washing thing where they lose 20%. Um, but, you know, there's no there's no real data in the literature to say one method is better than the other. Yeah. But I'm sure there are some practitioners that maybe have some processing capacity that they lose less than 50%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think even in those cases, like it's very patient dependent. Yeah. So it's it's hard to predict the exact outcome. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, we talked about um, the feeling among patients of it being a more natural approach. But I mean, in your view, is it preferable to something like a hyaluronic acid filler? What do you prefer to deal with? I think it's preferable for certain things. Yeah. Um, I think that it's... It's not preferable for things like some of those finer areas mm -hmm. where we would use nano fat mm -hmm. as yeah. an alternative, just because I think they're so easy and it depends what age the patient is. Yeah. If you're really young, mm -hmm. you know, we know that old filler behaves oddly. Yeah. Um, if, if you're willing to get things dissolved, 
um, then it's really not a problem. But so many people are unwilling to get filler dissolved. Because they've heard bad They've heard stuff. bad things about yeah. it. And also it's like you've invested in yeah. getting this filler and it's like you, you don't want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, nobody wants to see what they look like without the filler in. Okay. You know, they, they get very distressed. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so it's hard to get people to dissolve filler. So I think fat transfer maybe is a, is a good option for younger patients. Right. Okay. Before they start kind of filling and filling for many years and then running into issues. Um, I think it's great for the cheek area. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes so much filler to try and get to get the volume. volumized, yeah. um, unless you're doing something like a Sculptra, which is designed specifically for that. So I think it's really great for cheeks. Um, there are some things that the filler doesn't really work for. Mm -hmm. Some people have this kind of shadow that cuts across their cheek. Here is part of the aging process. There's a ligament here that tends to get deeper if you get any kind of tissue congestion above. Okay. Filler does not work. Right, interesting. Uh -huh. To take care of that ligament. So the only thing that works in my experience is actually fat transfer. Mm -hmm. But some of that is because from the device you're using to inject the fat, you're able to actually break up the ligament and loosen it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and so fat works much better for that. So I don't think there's one answer, I guess, is my point. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, if you're looking for a lot of volume, mm -hmm. I think fat is a better option. Mm -hmm. From a cost standpoint, you know, if you're going to do five or six syringes of filler, that's going to cost you almost as much as a single fat transfer procedure. Yeah. And then you're going to have to do that filler again in a year or two. So it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you said... Patients lose a certain amount of fat very quickly after the, the transfer. Then what's the average duration of, what's the fat life after you've done the transfer? Um, whatever lives, lives. Right, okay. Um, it will fluctuate with your weight. Uh huh. So if you gain and lose weight, it's going to gain and lose weight. Right. Um, and one interesting thing is that in some patients, not all patients, but you know, the fat remembers, kind of behaves like where it came from. Okay. <laughs> so if you're somebody who always, you know, if you gain five pounds, it mostly goes to your midsection. Yeah. Just because you transfer it to the face doesn't mean that it's not going to behave that way. Right. And so it can disproportionately gain that is in, so in, interesting. in relation to other areas of the face. It doesn't happen in everybody, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. So it, it must deplete with age then, like... Yeah. All, all fat. Okay. So mm -hmm. have you had, you know, patients who have had many years out of it from, from your experience or is it too recent, the type of treatment to? I mean, I, I mean, I have patients probably 10, 15 years out from a fat transfer and yeah. it seems to be doing Still fine, but around. you know, again, they, but they're also 10 to 15 years older. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to quantify. Yeah. Um, but the areas that we filled still look reasonably filled. Now, the curious question mm -hmm. that I actually am being asked quite a lot, um, when patients feel they have been overfilled mm -hmm. and they want to get rid of some of the fat, then I'm being asked, can I use my radio frequency device? What can I do? I've been back to see my doctor. They can't, they can't help me. Can I use a radio frequency device at home to melt this fat myself? Which doesn't feel like a good idea to me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what do, what do you do in that instance? If somebody comes back to you and says, I, I don't like, I feel like a hamster. What do I do? Um, so I don't think a home radio frequency device is going to be powerful enough to really um, affect the fat. Yeah. But there are some devices that, that do affect fat naturally. Mm -hmm. There's a procedure called Morpheus. Yes, yeah. It has pins that go into the skin and they deliver energy at, you know, uh, one, two, three, four millimeters for the facial applicator. Mm -hmm. Four millimeters down, you're in the fat. Right. The fat underneath the skin. So if it's fat under the skin, you should be able to melt it with Morpheus or there's a procedure called face tight that has a probe that goes underneath in that same plane, those procedures melt fat. Okay. Um, there's no reason I think it wouldn't be able to melt transferred fat. The only issue with transferred fat is some of, sometimes they put it in the muscle, mm -hmm. sometimes they put it on the bone, and obviously you have to be in the fat mm -hmm. with the heating device in order for it to melt. Um, so it's, a, it's harder to 
um, target it, mm -hmm. but it still can be done. I remember I had a patient that had had a facelift and a revision facelift and had some herniation of her buccal fat that came out. Mm -hmm. It was like literally a ball here and a ball here. Wow. Um, and, you know, she came about different strategies. And one of the things I suggested was using Morpheus yeah. in an aggressive manner to try and melt down that bit of buccal fat. And it didn't work 100%, but it worked pretty darn well. It helped. Yeah. And then we were able to kind of contour fill around it so that it was smooth. Yeah. Um, so it worked for buccal fat. It should work for transferred fat. Um, it just maybe harder might take more sessions yeah. than natural fat. I mean, that, that brings me on to risks. I mean, what are the risks? Um, obviously, it depends on uh, who the surgeon is, who's treating you. But I mean, what, what would the risk be for a patient? Um, well, some do depend on who's doing it. Others yeah, don't, right? Yeah. There's not a whole lot of risks. From the harvest, there's a risk of, of anything like a liposuction. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you're getting liposuction, you can get contour irregularities. Mm -hmm. You can get skin surface irregularities, even things that kind of behave like burns from the repetitive movement of the cannula. Um, somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing, that cannula could go in into your abdomen you know, puncture an intestine, those things have happened. Yeah. Um, but, you know, those sort of things shouldn't happen from somebody who has experience. Yeah. Um, in terms of the fat transfer, it depends where you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a transferred material that doesn't have blood supply initially. So it does have a risk of getting infected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very low risk, especially in the face, but it's not zero. Um, certain areas, there are nerves that are kind of coursing through the soft tissues. Obviously the person transferring the fat should know where the nerves are and blood vessels, things of that nature, um, in order to avoid injuring him. But there are things that could be injured during the course of the fat transfer. Again, very rare. I think probably the most significant risk, which isn't really a medical risk, is just that you wind up with less volume than you had hoped for. Okay. That's probably the big risk. Yeah. Um, and some people, if they do a surgical procedure, you can freeze fat mm -hmm. and you can use it later for transfer. Some people will bank fat. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if they need more, you just thaw it out and inject it. Yeah. Um, so that's one way that people who do a lot of fat transfer work around it. Does the frozen fat work as well as the fresh fat? Probably not, but it works better than no fat. Yeah. Would, would you tend to underfill, because you talked about patients coming back for a, a, a sort of second go to increase the volume. Is that mm -hmm. something that you do? Yeah. Definitely, because when you're underfilled, you can always just get a little more. Yeah. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm pretty conservative with the amount that I use when I do a single session. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned um, biostimulators like Sculptra. I mean, what's the comparison there for somebody who... Again, I get a lot of viewers who come to me and say that through some of these heat energy based treatments, they have lost a lot of, of fat or maybe through, you know, age or, or working out over the years. Um, how, how does that compare? How, what, how, what advice would you give to somebody who's lost a, a significant amount of facial volume due to fat loss? Mm -hmm. Would you think a biostimulator would be preferable or... It might be something you want to use in combination because, again, there are different factors. Like mm -hmm. Sculptra isn't stimulating fat. Mm -hmm. Sculptra is stimulating collagen. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the changes to the skin aren't just volume loss. It's also loss of collagen, loss of elastin, other, other changes to the skin itself. Um, so you may find that you have to do both. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I can't really talk too much about because it's pretty... It's pretty early in the trajectory is this concept of uh, exosomes. Um, okay. It's another type of, of treatment that's, that seems to be evolving and may, might show some promise. It's basically the idea of stem cells. Um, and they're like stem cells that are, that are from placental stem cells mm -hmm. um, that are able to be transferred. So uh, there are some products out on the market in the last six months about that. Um, but that's the idea that's ultimately going to be the best. That could be a next generation yes. one to watch. 
And one of the things about um, fat mm -hmm. that um, I, I should have mentioned before is one of the other reasons that fat transfer is, is good mm -hmm. is that fat actually has a lot of stem cells in it. Right, okay. And so there's a stem cell element to the fat transfer that isn't just about the volumization. It also does actually cause some other changes. But the point is, is um, because aging is multifactorial, I don't think there'll ever be a single treatment mm -hmm. that's yeah. going to get rid of all of it. It would be a personalized, more of a personalized approach. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there may be someone who needs Sculptra mm -hmm. and exosomes and fat transfer and maybe some Morpheus or something, you know, like all of these things in conjunction, you're treating different elements of the aging process. Yeah. Um, and presumably where you're putting in volume here as well, this is what can actually raise the gel. If you're yeah. putting volume along the cheekbone, that might negate the need for a uh, a surgery a lift of some kind well that's the thing is we don't know mm -hmm. what the ultimate outcome is going to be of people doing all of these preventative treatments yeah i mean if you think back 20 years ago before there was a lot of fillers mm -hmm. going on i mean the only options were surgical but in the last five ten years so many people have been doing these other treatments um you know 50 may not look the same 10 20 years from now Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we're already seeing that. Mm -hmm. I had to do a story. Somebody asked me about the cast from um, Sex and the City, the reboot. Yeah. Um, and they were interested in what sort of treatments they'd gotten. Mm -hmm. And and I said, I, I don't think any of them really have gotten any surgery. Yeah. Um, and they're all in their 50s and above. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I said, but all of them have been doing Botox and fillers and other types of treatments. Yeah. Because they're in that window. Um, so I think there's a lot of value to doing that. Yeah. And, you know, you may not be able to stave off everything, but I think people doing things like we're talking about, much less surgery yeah. down the line. Once you do have a little more experience with the exosomes, can we have a conversation about that? Yes. Okay, <laughs> deal. <laughs> I'm just never an early adopter. No, absolutely. Yeah. But that, that sounds fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Nice meeting you. And you.